Now, um, you're all very welcome this morning to the 123 Online Safety Conference. My name is Tom Marr. I am the chair of the Children's Rights Alliance, who is uh, leading the, the campaign, uh, along with uh, 16 other supporting uh, members. Um, we have an extensive agenda today, so uh, we'll get started uh, fairly quickly. Just one or two housekeeping issues I want to draw your attention to. The event is being broadcast live uh, on the Children's Rights Alliance uh, Facebook page. And we will be using the hashtag, uh, hashtag 123 online safety if you wish to uh, take part in, in the online conversation. The conference is kindly supported by the uh, Community Foundation for Ireland via its uh, RTE Comic Relief Fund. Uh, and I'm delighted to be able to introduce uh, Denise Charlton, who's the CEO of the Community Foundation for Ireland. Uh, who's provided significant support for the campaign. Denise has successfully taken leadership roles in campaigns on marriage equality, children's rights, and immigration reform. She was appointed CEO to the foundation in July 2020, and she leads the foundation's response to COVID-19. Denise, you're very welcome uh, to set the scene for us this morning. Thanks, Tom, and thanks to the Children's Rights Alliance um, for the invitation um, today. I'm just gonna make a couple of observations and from Community Foundation's perspective. I suppose the first observation is that this is a real key moment um, to ensure the online safety of, of children and young people um, in Ireland. And as advocates and as campaigners and allies, you've made a, such an incredible contribution and continue to make a, a contribution um, in the 123 online safety campaign. Um, it's because of you and your work, um, and it is within your gift, we believe, um, that the concerns of young people will be acted upon and their rights respected. And I'm really looking forward to hearing the contributions of the young people that are here with us this morning um, in that regard. Um, the, obviously, this moment is very timely as the government is committed to delivering legislation um, in the area. Um, as a campaign, you are at an organization, you're always working with young people and you're always aspiring to the gold standard. And the gold standard, not just for the protection of our own children here in Ireland, but as a model that other countries and jurisdictions can follow. Um, the recent engagement with the Oireachtas Committee uh, working in the area, your contribution again, so valued, so important, um, and really shaping the national conversation on online safety. Um, and as Tom said, Community Foundation for Ireland, really proud supporter of 123 Online Safety together with Ortida's Comic Relief. Um, Community Foundation, we've been around for two decades now, and I suppose we're really privileged to work with about 5,000 um, community voluntary and charitable organisations. And for us, it is those relationships, the relationships like that, like with yourselves, that are really important for us because they provide us with inputs and feedback. Um, and most importantly, they give us an ability to be able to respond um, to emerging issues um, with our donors. Online safety uh, and the need uh, for the rights for our young people to be respected in the virtual world, just as they are in the physical world, has been on our own radar for, for some time. And we're really grateful to the Children's Rights Alliance for presenting the opportunity that we could partner in um, really to look for meaningful change. And we're really pleased to support it. Um, what we hope to do as a foundation is not to shy away from complex or difficult issues like yourselves. We don't want to be fearful of helping uh, to guide vested interest into the space where they should be. And this is what this campaign is about. So in conclusion, like you, the next steps, we await the government's proposals and the bill on this very important issue. Um, we know and hear your out and, and actually concur with your, your out uh, standing concerns. The points you raise about an individual complaints mechanism for young people is a really valid one. Um, and the blueprint that you set out on how such a mechanism would work is, as always, really thought out and deliverable uh, in true Children's Rights Alliance style. Um, and we really hope that it will be acted upon uh, and it will be reflected in future leg legislation. It's fantastic to see the 16 organizations come together um, and to really uh, be advocating uh, for online safety um, uh, for children. 
So as I said, the convening is really timely. Uh, we know the minister is before the committee this week to set out our legislative priorities, and we know the bill is coming. So on behalf of our donors, or does Comic Relief, and all of us here at Community Foundation, I wish you every success in the brilliant, brilliant work that you do in this very important period. I'm delighted to be here, and I really look forward to the contributions. Thanks to all of you. Thank you very much, Denise. Uh, sometimes in advocating for the rights of children, uh, we, we do bring ourselves into uncomfortable spaces, but we need to be in this space uh, to make sure that the rights of children in the online space, as well as the physical world, are, are properly vindicated and upheld. Uh, and in that regard, uh, I'm delighted to introduce our keynote speaker. Leanda Barrington Leach is head of EU affairs at the Five Rights Organization. And Leanda, maybe you'll, you'll, you'll talk a bit about the Five Rights Organization. Uh, she previously worked uh, with the European External Action Service, uh, where she was advisor to the Secretary General, General focusing on strategic communications and the, the fight against disinformation. She also previously worked at uh, EU advocacy as a consultant and for nonprofits, always with a focus on human rights. Leander volunteers as an advisor to Plan International, supporting their work on children's rights in the EU foreign, in the EU foreign policy. Leander today hopefully will share insights from her work on tech reg regulation at EU level and the importance of protecting and respecting children's rights in the digital space. Uh, just another housekeeping issue, we will have a question and answer function session throughout Leander's um, presentation and indeed after the presentation we may have some time for, for, for Leander to, to address some of the questions that have been raised. So if you uh, as participants uh, put your questions into the, the Q&A function and we'll hopefully able to address as many of those as possible. Uh, Leander, you're very welcome, and I can't wait to hear uh, the wisdom you're going to impart to us this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you for that kind introduction. So indeed, um, my name is Leander. I am head of EU affairs at the Five Rights Foundation. We're a children's rights NGO, and our mission is to build a digital world that children and young people deserve. Um, so I'm really grateful for the invitation to speak here today, because um, it really is a critical time for children's rights in, in Ireland, in the UK, where our organisation is headquartered in the EU, where my work is focused, um, and also globally. Uh, I would like to take um, uh, the time, first of all, today to set out five principles that might help frame the conversation you're about to have with certainly the most important speakers of the morning who will come after me on the youth panel. Um, and also to keep in mind as you consider the provisions of uh, your uh, online safety and media regulation bill. Um, I'll then finish by looking at uh, where these principles have been used in a practical way and the challenges and the opportunities that remain. Um, but before I do that, I'd like to first um, remind uh, us all of some of the issues that uh, have brought us here today. Um, so childhood today is certainly lived online as much as it is offline, uh, pretty much all kids are online and uh, they make up a very substantial chunk uh, of the users of digital services, uh, estimated at one in five users in the EU is a child, one in three globally. So these kids, um, our own children, children of our friends, uh, whether there are professional charges or even children we don't know who we see in the streets or the playground, Whoever they are, wherever they are, offline, we keep an eye on them. We ensure they, they live, they play, they learn uh, in, in environments that are as safe and as inducive to their well-being and development as, as we can make them. We certainly treat them differently from adults because we recognize that as children, they have specific vulnerabilities and needs. But this is not the case online, where kids, as I've said um, also, they're there and they spend a lot of their time there. And online, what we take for granted in the physical world is the exception rather than the rule. Online, the rule is that everyone is equal. In other words, everyone is treated as an adult. The digital world is not optional for children, and yet it's a place where children's rights have been systematically overlooked, ignored, undermined, dare I say, trampled. So some examples, if I may. Children are routinely served up harmful content and not in small doses. Pornography, violence, pro-suicide, pro-anorexia. The impact is real and can be horrific. I recently learned, for example, that 70% of consumers of child sexual abuse material were first exposed to this content before the age of 18. 40% of them when they were under 13. 
more than half of them were not looking for this material. So just take a moment to think about that vicious circle. And it works similarly for hate speech and radicalization, misogyny, eating disorders, and other such topics, which I think our young friends will tell you more about later. Think about this and the society that we're allowing these systems to create. Children are also routinely introduced and contacted by adult strangers via friend and follower recommendation systems. Accounts of children as young as 11 have been recommended to groomers on popular social media platforms. Children are routinely nudged to lower their privacy settings, spend more time online and engage in age inappropriate behavior. Note, for example, that 80% of the top 50 games rated suitable for children five and under in the Apple App Store contain in-game purchases. So how can we make sure the digital world is one where children can thrive? First, we must recognize childhood online. A child is a child until they mature, not until they pick up a smartphone, which sounds, as we say in the UK, bleeding obvious. Until you recall that for the most part, the current age of adulthood in the digital world is set at 13 because of a piece of US marketing legislation um, known as COPPA. A child of 13 is not an adult, and in many ways, older children are at greater risk since younger children access fewer products and services, have greater adult supervision, and spend less time online. All children deserve protection. Second principle, children have existing and established rights, which apply online as they do offline. The UN Convention on the Rights of the Child sets out clearly the requirements of a safe and secure childhood. As we develop a digital world fit for children and childhood, we should not be reaching out for new or lesser rights, but rather deliver on the well thought out privileges and rights they already have claim to. Over several years, Five Rights served as consultants to the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child for the drafting and consultation with experts, member states and children of general comment number 25, which sets out in detail how children's existing rights apply in the digital environment. The general comment prescribes, among others, and I cite, that in all actions regarding the provision, regulation, design, management, and use of the digital environment, the best interest of the child must be a primary consideration. That children must be protected from content, contact, conduct, and contract risks. That businesses must undertake child rights due diligence, in particular, child rights impact assessments. That data protection, privacy by design, safety by design, and other regulatory measures must ensure that businesses do not target children using techniques designed to prioritize commercial interests over those of the child. There's lots more in the general comment, um, and I do recommend uh, that, that you take a look at it if, if you can. So picking up on that third principle, safety by design. The digital world is almost entirely privately owned and human built. It's a system that can be engineered and optimized for any purpose. So optimizing for growth is a choice. Optimizing for ad revenue is a choice. Optimizing for engagement is a choice. Optimizing for children's safety, or as we currently have it, failing to optimize for children's safety is a choice also. Safety by design, starting with a risk assessment and then a mitigation strategy, or purposefully designing for the well being of child users should be an industry norm. Undoubtedly, there are some sacrifices from shareholders or from time to time for the, from the frictionless convenience for some adult users. But for the most part, it requires the sector to do what it does best, provide a personalized user journey. In this case, with the understanding that the user is a child. Child-centered design is rarely a question of innovation or technology. It is almost always a question of corporate and political will. Fourth, we should not ask children to hold the responsibility for badly designed systems. In our work with children, we've often observed that those children who have recently or repeatedly done e-safety classes and courses have a tendency when something goes wrong to blame themselves. Why? Because most digital resilience and digital literacy is geared to bad actors and bad behavior, but fails to explain the nudges and focus of the system on growth, sharing and engagement which promotes bad outcomes for, ch for children. This sector is responsible for 25% of global GDP, but still there's this idea that young children should be resilient or responsible for navigating its pollution. For absolute clarity, of course, children should be digitally and data literate, 
but that is not instead of creating a digital world that has already been designed with them in mind. And finally, digital equity and empowerment. Safety is not a separate component to either of these things. Without dealing with ubiquitous porn, misogyny, religious and race hate, misinformation and scams, moderation in minority languages, oversight of data sets and algorithmic bias, etc., then children both here and in the global south will be denied meaningful access or will be disempowered when online. A lack of safety holds back progress for all, but importantly, it is particularly regressive for girls and for children of color or minority religious groups. Child online safety is an essential part of equity and empowerment, including the opportunity to have a stake in building and innovating our collective future. So practically, how can we implement these principles? Firstly, we need to lay down the norm and specify in our digital legislation that one, a child is anyone under the age of 18, two, children's rights apply wherever children are in practice, as in across all platforms and services that they use or that impact them, big or small, and whether or not they are designed specifically for children. Three, children have a right to access. We should not just shut them out. Four, children have a right to high levels of protection by design and default. Five, the best interests of the child should be prioritized. Secondly, after the norm, we need to set minimum standards. Even when companies and designers want to ensure the rights of kids, time and again in our work, we hear, oh, I never thought of that. It's the job of the regulator to ensure that designers and companies know what to think of and the standards against which they will be judged. Here, a lot of good work has already been done or is in the works. Let's see regarding children's data protection. In the UK, Five Rights Chair Beban Kidron introduced into law the age appropriate design code. So this code is based on the understanding that the features and practices designed to gather data are often intrusive or risky for children. So data protection has the ability to protect children by dialing down those features. It's important to note that while the code was much resisted when first suggested, this summer we saw a radical redesign focused on children's safety from all the platforms as they sought to meet the 2nd of September deadline for compliance. I don't have the time to go into the changes in detail, but they ranged from, pre from preventing direct messaging between children and adults they don't know, high privacy settings by default, turning off autoplay, disabling notifications after 9 p.m., safe search for under 18s, as well as widespread changes to targeted advertising, data collection and sharing, and the introduction of new well-being measures. What is more important than any single change is that the code put children's safety at the top of the to-do pile for the first time. We're delighted that the Irish Data Protection Commission has taken a similar approach with its fundamentals for child-oriented approach to data processing. We see the code inspiring initiatives to set standards for children's data protection from Sweden to Australia, the Netherlands to the US and Canada. And we hope to see the European Data Protection Board soon begin work on common guidelines, perhaps with Ireland in the lead. The second main avenue for change is by setting the norm and standards for all online services, as your online safety and media regulation bill aims to do. My colleagues in London are currently heavily engaged in the equivalent UK bill, which has a strong mandate to protect children. The expectation upon which the bill is built is that companies will have a duty to consider the impact of the products and services on children. Just like the age appropriate design code, its premise is that you should be providing a safe and secure environment for your customer, particularly when that customer is a child. The bill focuses on the systems and processes of services like their algorithmic recommendation systems and design features that create the scale and reach of harm rather than on specific types of content. It is underpinned by risk assessment requirements and in this respect takes a safety by design approach. At the EU level, we're also working on the Digital Services Act, which has the potential to require service providers to systematically assess risk and undertake mitigating measures with strong transparency and auditing provisions. The um, negotiators are having their final meeting to negotiate compromises this afternoon, and we're very hopeful that there will be very specific requirements for children uh, in there. There's also the AI Act, which proposes to ban outright AI systems that exploit the vulnerabilities of children. EU product safety regulation is equally being updated, and this should bring all digital products, as in anything that can be downloaded onto a physical device, so anything that has like an app attached to it or that exists for the service, will bring them into scope of stringent consumer protection legislation. 
This is really great because it's based on the precautionary principle. If you can't prove your product is safe, you can't put it on the market. Finally, we're expecting soon, next year because it's been delayed, a proposal on preventing and combating child sexual abuse online, which will hopefully include very strong provisions on safety by design. Let me finish with a word about parents. You would not expect a parent during the school run to check the airbag, the steering wheel alignment, the speedometer, to check that the brake pads are working or that the road signs have not been removed. For those things, you rely on manufacturing standards and the Department of Transport. A parent's job is to check the wing mirror before they pull out. This is what we need to do with the digital world. This is not a problem solved by parents and children, but rather a question of product safety and sufficient regulatory oversight. Because until we have a system in which safety of children comes before optimization for profit and growth, we will not have the digital world that children and young people deserve. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you very much for that, Leander. That was uh, a, a wide ranging and comprehensive assessment uh, of all that needs to be done to ensure the, the rights of, of children are, are vindicated online and indeed that children are kept safe online. Um, one, one thing before we go to the, the question and answer session, one thing occurred to me is that there appears to be strands from a variety of areas that already have a level of legislation. So the question then is that, it, should legislation seek to bring that all together or do we need to, 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 to uh, not so much reinvent the wheel, but do we need to, 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 to re-legislate in all those areas? For instance, you mentioned safety by design in, term, in terms of product standards. Is that something that we need to do again, or how do we how do we manage that, or what should we what should we, would be what, what should we be seeking to do in that regard? Tom, that's an excellent question. It's certainly a point that I think legislators everywhere are struggling with. What is uh, the right balance? Um, I think the the online ecosystem is. As I say, it's an ecosystem, so it's not just one thing, and therefore, um, a bit like the industrial revolution, this is, I mean, it's, it's a new industrial revolution, and just one bill is probably not going to do the trick, and it is important to look at this. Um, uh, first of all, as I say, set the norm, and that is where uh, online safety bill or Digital Services Act, in the case of the EU, is designed to really set that norm that uh, these rights apply online as they do offline, but then uh, a number of, uh, of other bills seek to address specific um, issues. And uh, uh, there is sometimes a question of overlap, and I think legislators are feeling their way to try and find the right balance. But I have to say um, that we personally, uh, me personally, and our organization, we are very keen on product safety legislation uh, because um, there are very strong systems there. Uh, and there's a lot of, uh, of knowledge um, and a lot of capacity for oversight, at least more than uh, um, you know, if we create new, new structures, as we did for data protection, as we will surely do in the case of the Digital Services Act. But it's interesting to note, for example, that at the EU level, the AI Act, the enforcement would be through market surveillance authorities, as in through uh, the organizations who are responsible for product safety. Um, and, and this does seem to make sense. In the end, these are companies we are dealing with and they need to uh, probably, at a certain point, we need to end the exceptionalism of thinking of them as, as you know, a, a case apart. They are companies uh, and they should um, be, be looked at and be judged uh, and enforcement should be the same as, as for other companies and therefore product safety legislation makes sense. Thank you for that. that that's very insightful. Uh, just one other point that occurred to me as you were speaking, that it, it appears, um, this will make me sound like a Luddite, but it appears that if we were setting up uh, online services, if you we were setting up the internet, the World Wide Web, it, it, and we were planning to introduce it, we would surely have legislated or we would have planned for all these things prior to the implementation. It appears that the implementation has happened and we're we're slowly but surely catching up uh, with with all 
the, the, the issues that, that the implementation um, of online platforms and social media platforms, uh, that, that, that we're only catching up with those now and that if we were to do it correctly, perhaps we would do the regulation beforehand and then have a seamless uh, um, introduction or implementation. Now, I know that's absolutely fantastical, but, but it just occurs to me that in many other facets of, of, of social, political, financial life, we do uh, plan and then implement. It appears we have implemented and now we're, we're trying to catch up in that planning. It, it's less of a question and more of a point. I, I don't know what you think about that. Indeed, I think um, when there is, I mentioned the industrial revolution, when there is a, a big change like this, it is probably impossible to foresee how, how it will develop. And so it makes sense that certain legislation needs to come afterwards. I think what is in a way unforgivable um, is that our existing rights have been taken away. Uh, in the online world, there has been a regression. Um, if we talk certainly about children's rights, as I say, just the fact that children are children until they are 18. Um, and that is a, a principle that predates uh, the internet. And yet somehow we ended up with lower ages online, um, which should never have happened because anything we do should still have respected existing norms and law. So that part is, uh, is unforgivable. And it's not just children. Um, I think for women's rights, for example, it's a regression online with all the hate speech and misogyny. There's uh, the, this, the fact that the norms have not been applied. That is one part that we could uh, have foreseen um, and upheld those rights from the start as this new system was being developed yeah yeah and um, something you, you you said resonated with me and i've actually taken it down and i'll be using it again uh children's rights apply to wherever children practice and i think that's that's central to, to anything we do in terms of making the online experience safe for children uh, we need to to uh to to abide by that principle. I'm going to look at a couple of questions now, if you don't mind, uh, Leander. The first is from Naomi Feely. Are there any examples of other jurisdi jurisdictions where states have incorporated elements or all of the UN General Comment 25 into their domestic law to protect the rights of children and young people online? Or do you know of any plans to do this in any e EU member state? Thank you, Naomi. That's uh, another very interesting question. Um, General Comment 25 was adopted in April this year, uh, so it's quite new. At the moment, uh, our priority is to raise awareness about the General Comment and indeed to get it cited in, uh, in relevant um, policy strategy law. Uh, at the same time, uh, we do think it could go further. You may be aware that uh, Scotland um, recently uh, transposed uh, the UN Convention into, into Scottish law. Um, but this is not something which is, is normally done. We do have a project though, which we're just starting um, with uh, uh, law students um, at the University of Cambridge, if I'm not mistaken, um, to look at how the general comment could be transposed into UK law. Uh, we'll see what comes of that, but then we will definitely be looking at how this could uh, be used in other jurisdictions and at the, at the EU level. At the moment, um, uh, the general comment has been cited in uh, in certain jurisdictions. I can tell you at the EU level that the strategy on the rights of the child, which was uh, adopted, I think, on the same day that the general comment was brought out. So there was some juggling to do there, but we ensured that uh, the general comment uh, is cited in that strategy. It's cited, uh, for example, also in the AI Act. Um, and so uh, it's starting to get there. But uh, as I say, this is new. So uh, I think it, it relies on, on activists and on children's rights um, organizations to ensure that legislators are aware that it is there. Because once they are aware, normally it's not controversial. It's already been through the whole consensus process at the UN level, um, but uh, it can very easily get forgotten because children's rights and the digital um, uh, policy making area tend to be quite separate and digital policy makers are not normally aware of it. Um, so, so getting it cited in, in legislation is very important, and then hopefully in time we can go further than just having it cited. 
Thanks. Uh, and I think that's, you know, that, that's part of the aims of the campaign here is to make sure that that while uh, UN General Common 25 may not be transposed completely into legislation, that absolutely it, it, it does influence the development of, of legislation. So thanks for that. Uh, Alex Cooney, thanks for the really interesting presentation, Leander. One argument made here against the online safety element of our upcoming bill is that regulators should wait for the DSA to come into force across Europe so that there's no contradictory requirements. Uh, we are keen to progress regardless. What are your thoughts on this? So do we, do we wait and somebody else will do the work for us? Oh, um, I think if we, if we said that, we'd never do anything, would we? Um, we'd always, always wait. Um, first of all, contradiction. Um, there can be no contradiction, or if there were, it would be thrown out immediately, as in you cannot, if you agree something in terms of EU law, then uh, national law cannot undermine that EU law. Um, but EU law is always a foundation, it's a flaw, uh, which means that any country can go further. So if your regulation uh, builds on and goes further and puts extra requirements as compared to EU law, then all the better. Um, so I don't think this is something to worry about. I think that uh, the fact that these are being considered uh, at the same time is good. It means that, uh, uh, you know, compared to most member states, there is a, a stronger awareness and national debate um, in Ireland so that you can have uh, a more influential position in the negotiations at European level. Um, and you can also, uh, as I say, now the council, um, the member states at the EU level have agreed their, first, their position. The parliament is finalizing its position. Within a month, you'll know what they are. And so you'll also be able to see the gaps and see where you can go further. Yeah, so, so we need to continue uh, while, while uh, maintaining a watch and brief on the, the DSA to see where we go with that as well. Thanks very much for that. And uh, are there any more questions? There is a question, are participants uh, allowed access to the questions being posed? I'm not sure, uh, Noel, whether that's the case or not. Um, I can see them, obviously, and I'll pose the questions as they come in um, uh, to Leanda. There's another question here from Edwina Mulcahy. Thank you, Leanda, for a great talk. May I ask Leanda how she would like to see education address the communication revolution? Okay, well, what role does, does our ed, ed, education services um, play in, in, in seeking to keep children um, safe online? Um, I think there are multiple aspects to that. There's the question of uh, digital and data literacy, um, which I addressed uh, um, earlier, where I think, of course, there's a very important, uh, um, that's a very important piece of the puzzle. As an organization, uh, we don't focus on this um, because, as I say, we also believe it's sometimes used as an excuse um, also by tech companies to push uh, the, the digital literacy or the parental controls, these kind of aspects, uh, rather than um, touch upon their own systems and, and business model, um, which uh, yeah, we believe it's not an excuse and it's complementary and first and foremost, the systems need to be properly designed, and then we can educate people. <laughs> As we do, you pass a driving test, you take you know, your, um, your theoretical exam. Of course, you have to do this, but the premise needs to be that the system is safe to start with. Um, on education, I think there's also another very interesting piece, which is how we use digital services for education with uh, um, uh, the recent uh, um, homeschooling and online schooling uh, with the pandemic, what we've seen is um, uh, big companies controlling a lot of that, uh, those educational systems um, and, <laughs> and getting an awful lot of data with no standards about how that is gathered, how it is used. Uh, so I think this is a whole other part of the puzzle, um, which uh, uh, my colleagues in the UK are also starting to work on, also as part of the Digital Futures Commission, um, a project that, uh, that we're running in partnership with many other organisations. Um, but, uh, but yes, th these are two major aspects when it, when it comes to education. So it's not just literacy, it's also um, education online and who runs that and how is it run? 
Yeah, that's interesting. Actually, most of the the, the facilities through which uh, online education is provided is provided by um, platform providers. Um, your analogy about the parent who takes responsibility not for um, uh, doing an entire mechanical check on a car, their job is to look at the wing mirror. That, that's a very useful analogy in terms of, of how we need to address this. Education is one aspect, um, but it isn't the be all and end all. Um, that, that, that's a, a useful insight. Um, Fiona Jennings, thank you for your insights, Leanda. A key ask of our uh, 123 online safety campaign is that an individual complaints mechanism be provided for. Uh, the UK did not go this route. Can you speak a little to this? Uh, and that's Fiona Jennings from the ISPCC. Thank you, Fiona. Um, I'm not working on the UK bill, so uh, I can't really comment in detail about why they, uh, they, they didn't. Um, I think a complaints mechanism is very important. Now, I don't know the detail, I have to say, of your bill either, so I don't want to comment too much in detail on that. Um, I will say, uh, which you might find interesting though, a few words about the AI Act. Uh, so as I mentioned, the EU Artificial Intelligence Act includes um, an outright ban on AI systems that exploit the vulnerability of certain users, children being a particularly cited um, group. Um, the thing is that for that, in order to enforce it, you as a child would first of all have to realize that you have been exploited by, let's say, an AI recommender system, that it has you know, exploited the fact that you didn't know that you were dealing with an AI system because you're a child, um, that uh, you didn't realize that uh, it had uh, a waiting system that put let's say negative content uh, as um, the whistleblower Francis, uh, Francis Hogan recently revealed the waiting system that negative content is uh, ranked five times heavier than any kind of positive content. Let's say you as a child realized somehow that you had been um, exploited um, based on this vulnerability, uh, then that you managed to get a court case together, you managed to prove uh, that there was mental or physical harm because of this specific system, this specific algorithm caused you a real world harm uh, and that it was systemic and not just for you, um, but that it would cause other children harm in, in a similar way. First of all, that would take years. It's, and then it's just being able to complain is important, but uh, it's very important. What we're asking for in the AI Act is the precautionary principle so that uh, it has to be um, safe before you start, that the burden of proof be reversed from the victim to the company. As a company, if you're asked, you need to be able, be able to demonstrate that your system does not cause this harm and not the other way around, and that the regulator should have a duty to investigate. Um, so if those elements are already in your bill, then and you're just missing this complaint system, complaint system, you know, would be important. Um, but it doesn't, you know, if the burden is always going to be on the child to prove harm to be able to identify and complain, um, then I would say that wouldn't be enough. I think from our perspective, it is exactly that, that we need to use the precautionary principle. We need to ensure that all the mechanisms are in place and that the complaints mechanism is at the end of that, as opposed to a catch all, as you say, um, for absolutely effort for, for, for kind of design, poor, poorly designed uh, processes. And then the complaints mechanism is supposed to catch all. It's more that that our, our, we advocate for a complaints mechanism that is just, just catches all the things that fall out of what is a very, very clearly and obviously well-designed system. Um, thanks for that. And Kieran Shanley, uh, you may not be able to answer this, and I'm quite happy if, if that's the case. Uh, what, is, what do you believe is lacking in the UK Online Safety Harms Bill and in the Digital Services Act? Now, as you say, you, you haven't worked on the, the, the bill, but um, uh, I'm not sure how to... If you're aware of any things that are lacking in that bill that potentially we could learn from. Um, so I, I would be very happy to, to follow up on the UK bill. 
My understanding is that one of the things that uh, is lacking in the UK bill, but which you have in your bill, is the mandatory codes of practice. Um, so that that certainly, uh, from from hearing my colleagues discuss it, is is one issue that is lacking in the UK bill. Um, now I can speak a lot more to the the EU um, and the digital services um, yeah. act. There, the proposal from the Commission uh, came out before uh, the adoption of General Comment 25. Um, and so while there was you know, uh, some general provision for, for children's rights, it didn't have uh, a detailed consideration of how those rights apply online. So, so that's, uh, you know, that, that's really missing. By the way, the general comment at the moment is not cited in the, in the UK bill either. So that, that's a gap, which I, I understand it is in, in, in your bill. So, so that's also really good. Um, but the, uh, the, the DSA, the original approach was uh, to ensure that very large online platforms should have uh, essentially a duty of care, uh, including uh, as regards children's rights. Uh, the trouble is that very large online platforms in this case probably is only estimated at between five and ten um, companies. Uh, whereas we know that uh, children um, use a very wide uh, range of services and that often they're the early adopters of technology. Um, and it's, uh, it's by kids, teenagers playing around with stuff that things become big. Uh, and so a lot of harm can be done um, before they get big. And often when platforms sometimes get really big, then children are off to the next thing. <laughs> uh, so, so it's not enough to, to look only at very large online platforms. Um, so we are calling for all platforms, as I said, uh, wherever children are, then their rights need to be need to be respected. Yeah. Uh, then in terms of the um, risk assessments and mitigating measures at the moment, the proposal of the, the Commission um, makes a very nice long list of things that potentially companies can do to say, oh, now we've done it. Uh, and then choose auditors that they like, who they pay. <laughs> uh, so, so these, um, it, it's not, uh, the, the proposal is not prescriptive enough uh, for our liking. We want very clear statutory standards uh, to be provided for. And uh, although the transparency is good, uh, we want independent auditing, of course. Oh, thanks for that. Two more quick questions before we move on. Uh, Nolene Blackwell, it's a great presentation. What do you say to those who say that trying to impose standards nationally or even at an EU level uh, is useless because the platforms operate uh, beyond the, the country or the EU? What should our bill include to counteract that, uh, if that is possible to do? It's, it's something that occur had occurred to me that, that do national, does national legislation work or can it work? Well, I think that's the, the big, probably the biggest lesson of the UK age appropriate design code. Um, you know, you could say, oh, goodness, the UK has fallen out of the EU. <laughs> um, this is going to make, you know, it's going to be a drop in the ocean now. But the thing is, um, for platforms, uh, and, and this is, it's also an argument for why regulating for children can help everyone. In the, so it's geographic, but it's also, uh, you know, in terms of, no. of ranges, uh, is that for most platforms, it doesn't make any sense to make a change only for one jurisdiction. So if they have to make a change, as they did with the age appropriate design code in the UK, they will make it generally for their services globally, they will often make it for all users as well, and not just for children, because it's so much easier for them. It's so much easier, and then they can gain lots of brownie points by saying they did it of their own goodwill. Yes, yeah, so, so what you're actually saying is that, that if we push ahead with our legislation, it's possible that we can influence worldwide uh, practices. Okay, that, that's a, a different take, it's a useful take. And finally, last question, given your, this is from Noel Howard, Leanda, given your stats you quoted at the beginning of your talk, what is your view on the age of digital consent? Okay, so the age of digital consent, which is set by GDPR now, is between uh, 13 and 16 in, in EU countries, um, which was a completely random... Um, <laughs> A random requirement which uh, shows as well how children's rights were just not on people's minds during the negotiations and they made a fudge of it um, at the end. Um, so that, that's point one. Point two is that uh, this age of 13, um, as I mentioned, is, is because of uh, US legislation. Copper. The US, together with North Korea, we should all be very clear, the only two countries in the world that have not ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Uh, 
Um, everyone else has, for all of us, 18 is the age of adulthood. Um, but there is an important provision which says, unless uh, defined differently by national law, and this is why in European law, you'll always have the word minors rather than child, because a minor then allows for a member state to define, you know, specifically in a certain area um, at an age that they want. So at least GP GDPR says they can't go below 13, but I don't think anyone would have done that um, anyway. Uh, so this is why also citing the convention is always very important because then you can come back and say, no, based on the convention, which you've cited in your bill, it's 18. Um, now, there are, there's another very important point to make, which is that age of consent for data processing and children's rights are very different things. And as you notice, um, even uh, the age appropriate design code in the UK and the Irish fundamentals uh, are both based on GDPR. GDPR, which sets this age of consent between 13 and 16, and yet they're about children's rights, and they set out provisions for all under 18s. The age of consent is just the age at which a child can, by him or herself, consent to the processing of data. And under this age, it needs a parent or a guardian to consent to the processing of data. This does not mean, because you agree that your data can be used so that you can access a service, this does not mean that you suddenly give up all of your rights. Um, and these are often conflated. So we talk about the age of digital maturity or digital adulthood. That's not the same thing. We can agree or we can agree to disagree on what the age of consent should be. It's not the same thing as the age of adulthood. Okay. Listen, thanks very much for that, Leander. Uh, the depth and breadth of your knowledge and expertise has my heart both soaring and heavy in that one, you've obviously, you've given us a lot of food for thought, but there's a lot of work to be done in terms of all the strings that we have to pull together to get this right. Um, thanks very much. And um, I've no doubt we, we will be in contact again. If you don't mind me saying, though, we come to the more important or most important part of the, the, the morning. We want now, if you don't mind, to talk to uh, our youth panel, and that's our young people who will give their experience um, of the using uh, 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 social media platforms. And uh, that experience should inform the way we, we progress in terms of the, 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 the online regulation and online safety. Uh, with that in mind, I will ask, if you don't mind, first, we're going to have a, a video from Anya from the Rape Crisis Center. She couldn't be with us today, but we're going to start off with a video um, presentation from Anya. And we will then have a number of presentations and I'll introduce those as we go along. Um, we, to allow as much time for the, the young people to present their own views and ideas, we won't be doing an open Q&A session. There may be one or two questions that, uh, uh, I, that may occur to me that I may ask uh, the, the young people after their presentations. Um, and we continue, I'll remind you to continue to use the hashtag 123 uh, online safety. So we will look now, if we can, to the first presentation, which is Anya. Hi, my name is Anya, and I'm going to be talking about my experience with social media. So I've had quite a positive experience on social media. It's been a great way for me to keep in contact with my friends and family. It's been a great way to make friends from different parts of Ireland, from different countries. And through that, I've got to learn a lot about other people and their cultures and their beliefs. And I've been able to teach them the same about my cultures and my beliefs. And it's nice because you get like that first hand experience instead of when you go on Google and research something. And it's kind of just you don't know if it's genuine or if it's made up. So it's really nice to be able to see other people's first-hand experience of life and how they compare to my own. Though with social media there's also been negatives that have impacted on me. So I have had some really negative experience where it's affected my mental health. One of those such experience would be I end up feeling quite isolated 
I could go through social media and I'd be sitting there home alone and I'd just see all my friends out enjoying life and I'm sitting there like why am I not there why have I not got the invite to do that and it can really hurt and just feel leave you feeling in a not nice place other things other negatives on social media that haven't directly impacted me but I've seen impact other people are how it's so easy to steal someone's information and their pictures and make fake accounts about them to either spread hate about this person or to go about catfishing other people which can in turn affect the person's future relationships their current relationships their self-esteem and can leave them feeling quite violated other thing other negatives would be how easy it is to cyber bully someone on social media it can be done so easily and people can make up multiple fake accounts to do this and even though you can just report and report and try get it solved that's still going to massively affect someone's image of themselves and how they feel and their trust in others some things i think that can be done that will help social media for future generations would be if education programs are brought into primary schools to show children how to safely use social media and the internet and what to look out for and how they can make their accounts private and how they should only accept people that they know and that they're friends with so just to educating them and making sure that they're using the in, the internet in a safe way that's not going to hurt them or it's not going to hurt other people and to keep them protected and from anything bad happening to them. Something that I would also think would be quite beneficial would be when you're creating accounts you have to verify your identity that way it could help a lot of fake profiles being made and it could also help with limiting the amount of young young people who are on social media and then just kind of stopping them from having to witney witness and experience these negative things all in all social media is a great thing and it can be used really positively but there are some things that need to be changed about it to better use it for people in the future Sorry about that, some technical difficulties. Now, um, thank you very much for that, Anya. Um, it was very useful um, to, get, to get Anya's views. And I think uh, what we can see there, we can see uh, the positive aspects of, of, of uh, online platforms along with the perils. And indeed, some suggestions from Anya as to how to deal with those perils um, that could be instituted into, uh, into Irish legislation. Uh, can I ask you all to welcome all of the rest of the, the youth panel? We have Lauren, Grania, Joe, Alec, Neve, Ashling, Sophie, and Amy. And I'm going to call on uh, each group uh, in our, our individual individually and ask them to, to, to uh, give their presentations. First, I will ask um, Lauren and Grania. Uh, to talk they're young social innovators and they'll talk about their experience of uh, their online experience and uh, thank you lauren and Gronya. thank hi um are you able to see this now the presentation uh yes that's perfect. that's perfect yeah we can see it um hi um i'm Gronya, and this is lauren and we are members of red flags our project red flags is a part of young social innovators and it is on the top the our project is focused on the social issue of toxic relationships. Our project last year won the title of Young Social Innovators of the Year and won the YSI Gold Award and Virgin Media's Digital Innovation Award. We feel the issue of toxic relationships among our generation is mostly prevalent online, which is very relevant to what we're speaking about today. This is um, images of our project and we have the um, our group slogan, sorry, that's our bell, um, detect to protect. Uh, the detect is an anagram and each, sorry, 
the, the alarm will switch it up yeah, in a second. It's, it's, sorry. It's finished now. Um, that's, that's quite all right. That's quite sorry all right. Sorry about that. Um, the, our anagram detect protectables are project slogan and detect stands for each letter represents each letter represents um a feature of an uh, unhealthy relationship and then protect features each letter features a feature of a healthy relationship and we use this really to put our message across in a really quick and easy way this is some of the recognition that we received from our project our classmate Rosha was interviewed on RTE about our project. Um, we were featured in the local newspaper Carries Eye twice. We were, myself and Rosha were interviewed on Ireland AM and our project was also featured in the Irish Times, which has been amazing recognition for our project and has really helped us bring our message across even more last year. Um, this is our digitalized version of our mural that we created last year, which was kindly given to us by Virgin Media. We've received so much support through Virgin Media after winning the competition. And at the moment, we are in the process of making a television ad and also trying to put um, our mural here up on billboards around Tralee Town. Um, and they've given us such great support. And here we have, um, on one side, you can see the phrases that would commonly be used in an unhealthy relationship where someone feels unsafe. And then on the, uh, they're actually on both sides, and then at the bottom, you can see the signs of a toxic relationship and then the other side, signs of a healthy relationship, which is a great infographic showing quickly people at first glance how effective an uh, unhealthy relationship can be. Um, these are images of our Instagram page. And um, over the third lockdown, we used Instagram a lot, seeing as we weren't in school um, with our classmates and things like that. So we didn't really have a lot of opportunities to spread it around the school. So we used Instagram um to spread it um we also started a campaign called big to donate which we were really successful with and we raised over 700 euro for the um adapt women's refuge and we got social media influencer emma carney involved and she got a lot of her followers to donate and also to bake which um raised a lot of awareness for our project um we encountered a few difficulties with our instagram over the course of the lockdown and even in school with people just commenting like just really unhelpful things under our pages they're just dming us just 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 not nice things to us but we used filters and we deleted all the comments and um i feel like we could do something to try help with filtering bad comments like that because really our project is just really to be positive and if you were going through our, our page and you see these like negative comments it's just not fair and I just don't really understand why people would do it so um yeah I feel like Instagram should have a few filters or something that like certain things just can't be commented but we were able to delete them all anyway so it was okay um but yeah overall Instagram really did help us and also TikTok helped us spread our campaign among a lot of people our age seen as literally everyone has Instagram at this point um so yeah, and then uh, the next bit. Yeah. Thanks so much. Um, just in terms of online, last year we kind of started up our project and our school went to, uh, everywhere went into lockdown. So we were at home. So we really found the internet and just everything online really helped enhance our project because we had no other way of getting our message across. So our speak out video, which we created online can be viewed um, on YouTube. If you just search up red flags, speak out video, we were interviewed on the Ryan Tuberty show as well, and our interview can be viewed online and also Ireland AM if you do want to find out more about our project. Um, yeah. And we're also in the middle of um, forming an SPHE lesson pack. We started it last year and we got a good bit done, but now we're starting to fine tune it and we're going to send it out to teachers in our own school and teachers in other schools to try help in SPHE classes so people can see the toxic um, traits and what you don't deserve in a relationship and what you should expect. And we were definitely planning on having one of those four units mostly based on safety online mm -hmm. and how toxic relationships can occur online and ways to avoid it just to improve your overall well-being and happiness. Yeah. So thank you so much for listening thanks. to our presentation. Okay, uh, thanks for that. Uh, first of all, congratulations on the, all the awards you won. That's absolutely fantastic. And also congratulations on everything you've covered. You've actually what you've done has has given you a lot of experience and understanding of 
both the positives of, of online platforms and also the difficulties associated with them. And you're in a great position then to be able to say, listen, here's potentially how you could fix that through regulation and through uh, the, the, the Online Safety Act. So thanks very much for that, Lauren and Grania. And uh, just to note for all our youth panel contributors today, they are taking valuable time out of their, their lives. Uh, and we could see that with Lauren and Grania with their school bell going off, like they are definitely uh, 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 live. So thanks very much for that. And uh, thanks very much for all the panel panel members taking time out um, of their busy, busy schedules. I'm now going to ask uh, Joe from the National Youth Council of Ireland. Joe will be speaking on how the internet can be used to radicalize young people into extreme viewpoints. Uh, Joe, thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. So as Tom said, my name is Joe. I'm here representing the NYCI. And um, yeah, I feel like with online safety, there are so many issues and topics that we have to be concerned about. Something that really often gets kind of overlooked is the discrimination and hate speech that is so prevalent in so many online communities and that young people can very often fall victim to these um, places. And I would argue that they're actually being brainwashed into believing certain things which are incredibly problematic. So obviously I am a woman of color and I'm an immigrant and I've seen this happen in real time. I've seen some of my friends, some of my peers become involved in this really toxic online communities where they see such awful things and they begin to repeat them and they begin to kind of absorb them into their minds. And sometimes we see those real life actions can have really fatal consequences. So we've seen a rise in neo-Nazism, we've seen a rise in gun violence and in hatred towards minorities and hatred towards women, towards religious minorities, towards people of color, and it's all rising. And I would argue that is directly linked to online, what's happening online and how there are basically no safeguards. No safeguards to protect young people from seeing these things, no safeguards to protect the vulnerable, how vulnerable they are in being um, brainwashed. It's really awful. And I, to be frank, I just don't think tech companies are doing enough to help these people. And it's not just harming um, the people who are being led to believe these awful things. They then move on and harm other people. So it's like this really awful cycle. So I think that the idea of an online safety commissioner, that's where this comes in. The idea of someone who can take down these posts when the, government, when the tech companies aren't doing enough to prevent them from being shown to young people, that is what we need. Because quite frankly, the current system isn't working. And we're going to see, unfortunately, the results of that as time goes on. We're going to see this rise in hatred towards anyone who is not the stereotypical perfect white um, ideal that, that, that is being promoted in these communities. And quite frankly, it's, it's scary to see this happening in real time because you traditionally think that young people would be more progressive, but the internet and how unguarded it is, is showing that that is not always the case. And so I would really, really back this campaign personally. And um, I think that this is something we absolutely need to have. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Joe, for that, that um, uh, insightful um, contribution. I think you're, you're right in saying that young people are naturally not prejudiced. They're not, um, they, they're, they're not full of hate. And I think it is uh, the influence of the, the, the online platforms that can cause difficulties, the difficulties that you've mentioned. Thank you very much for that. And we'll now go on to Alec. Uh, he's also from the National Youth Council, Council of Ireland and he will be sharing positive experience with uh, his online world. Thank you. Perfect, thank you so much. Uh, so yeah, my name is Alec, I'm 18, I'm from the uh, NYCI. Um, I've had more positive experience with social media. So just a little bit of background, I'm actually LGBT. And I remember when I started discovering myself and started figuring myself out, I use social media to get to understand myself a bit more. Um, I kind of liked it because I didn't feel alone. Um, I found people, I entered into a lot of safe spaces, which I was scared to do in public. Um, but social media helped me like a lot better with it. Um, I also use social media to fund my top surgery. So I had a GoFundMe and I shared videos and I asked for people's help. And I think I raised money in like less than four months which it was five grand, it was pretty hard to do. Um, but I managed to do it in four months by using social media, Instagram, uh, TikTok, all of the all of the stuff. Um, so yeah, I think I think that although there is negatives, I think we should also look a bit at the positives and instead of just turning around and being like, well, 
just get rid of social media if it's all negative. So I think we should look at a bit of positives as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Alec. There, there is a recurring theme, which is that the, the online platforms are a hugely positive um, facility for people, particularly for young people to use. Uh, and therefore, it's not a case of simply saying we'll ban these because they're bad. They're actually very, very positive, uh, affirming um, uh, modes of communication. It's just that like every um, interaction, we do have to have a level of regulation to make sure that people are feel safe and are kept safe and their rights are vindicated um, in, in whatever sphere that they practice in. So thanks very much for that, uh, Alec. We'll now go on to Neve. Uh, Neve is from Faroiga. And she's going to discuss the uh, or speak about the importance of digital skills and digital safety for young people, so that they can get as much uh, positive experience from uh, the online platforms. Neve, you're very welcome, and thanks very much. Thank you, Tom. So, hello, my name is Neve. I am part of Fergus Online Safety Group. So, as Tom said, our message is to spread the importance of digital skills and digital safety for young people so that they can get the best out of the opportunity technology offers. I believe that there needs to be a lot more measures put in place to make sure young, to make sure young people are safe online. But we have to be careful to make sure that they don't become fearful of it too, particularly for younger teens who are just beginning to use technology. So what do I mean when I say digital skills and safety? Well, our digital skills mean our ability to use digital devices communication applications and networks to access and manage information. Basically the knowledge of how to use our phones and laptops along with our apps. But this does not include how to recognize if something bad happens to you and how, how to deal with the situation effectively. This is where digital or online safety comes in. Online safety is the knowledge of how to protect yourself while using these devices from harm through awareness, education and information. This is why I believe that along with teaching a young teen how to use their devices, we should also be teaching them how to stay safe and recognize when something is not right online. We should be teaching them how to understand and control their privacy settings, how to block and report on all the apps that they wish to use, whether that be Instagram, Snapchat, or TikTok. And we should teach them how to deal with online bullying and tell them that it's not their fault if they are being victimized. This can be taught either at home or in school, but I've noticed that the way young people are taught these days is through fear. By this, I mean they are taught that everything about the internet is bad and it is an unsafe place. I don't think that in this day and age, it is right to teach something that should be beneficial to use with this technique. If we are taught it is an unsafe place, then doesn't that mean there's a lack of procedures in place to protect these young people? If, this, if that's the problem, then the solution is simple. Put more safety measures online so people do feel safe. At a young age, I was taught and heard all about the dangers of being online and how it can negatively affect people. And I found people forgetting to talk about the positives. For example, this conference would not be happening without the use of Zoom and our laptops or phones. And because of our two lockdowns, schools nationwide had to close. <laughs> COVID-19 has highlighted so many advantages for me. I could talk for days about it. And even before COVID-19, with a quick Google search and some YouTube videos, you can practically learn how to do anything you want. We are the generation of people who have an infinite amount of knowledge at the click of a button at the tips of our fingers. However, talk of online only goes to one thing, and that is the negatives. So what are these negatives? They can include cyberbullying, social media addiction, and so many more things that I just sadly don't have detail to go into. So cyberbullying. Unlike physical bullying, it can be hard to find a person responsible for cyberbullying. This is because people use the anomaly that social media apps provide to gain people's trust and then bully them. For instance, they might create a fake profile and act friendly to a classmate in real life then later bullying and harass them online. These online attacks often leave deep mental scars and even drive people to suicide in some cases. There are some measures put in place to prevent cyberbullying. For example, most social media apps have a block and report function, 
which lets people stop receiving messages from the bully and report to the social media app about the abuse that happened. But sometimes I find these features not enough because the person can just create another account and the cycle repeats. I think there needs to be a measure put in place for, to prevent this and stop the cycle after the first time. I think this would help victims feel less paranoid and help young people not, not to fear the internet. Social media can be more addictive than cigarettes and alcohol. Young people are surrounded with loads of social media platforms today. For example, Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, TikTok, Twitter, just to name a few. And if you ask someone how many of these they had, the answer would most likely be more than one. It has a powerful draw for people that leads them to checking it all the time without even thinking about it. If you're not sure whether you're addicted to social networks, try to remember the last time you went a full day without checking your social media accounts. Do you feel rejected if someone unfollows you? And if your social networks completely disappear tomorrow, would it make you feel empty or depressed? At the end of the day, social media sites want you to keep scrolling as long as possible so they can show you lots of ads and make more money. This is called attention economy. And because of this, these sites need your eyes on them for as long as possible. I think the government should have a procedure here to prevent young people being subjected to this because having an addiction like that at such a young age can impact their mental health immensely. So to round up everything that I've been saying, I believe that there needs to be more measures put in place for young people so that we don't have to teach them to become fearful of the internet and instead help them to feel safe knowing that these procedures can help them. This is why I think that an online safety commissioner would be beneficial because it would give these young people that security that they need. Thank you. Thanks, Neve. Uh, very eloquently put and a lot of insightful ideas. Uh, I like your, your idea where you say that most of the way we teach children and young people about um, use, the use of online platforms is through fear. Um, that's probably not the most effective way for people to learn how to use um, um, online platforms in a, in a safe and a productive way. So thanks very much for that, Neve. Um, I'll now ask Ashling from Spun Out. She's on the Youth Action Panel of Spun Out. Uh, Ashling, you're very welcome and thanks very much. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ashling and I'm a 17 year old Leaving Cert student from Dublin. I'm speaking today as a member of SpunOut.ie, specifically the Dublin Regional Action Panel. The lack of awareness and regulations regarding online safety in Ireland is appalling and concerning. The evident negligence over the previous several years to take action against this has been detrimental to current and future generations. The online safety and media regulation bill is crucial to the well-being of young people on this island. As part of a recent campaign launched by Spunout.ie regarding online safety, I wrote an anecdotal, uh, an anecdotal piece. The article centered around my experiences as a young teenage girl on social media. In this piece, I went into detail about the, the harassment which I endured from the age of 13 and which is still a prevalent part of my life, as well as the lives of many of my classmates and friends. I wrote about the numerous unsolicited inappropriate pictures perceived from men twice my age and the imminent verbal abuse which would follow when I refused to reciprocate. I described how I believed I knew the people I was adding and when I blocked my harassers, how they would create new accounts under new names, which seemed vaguely familiar to me. And so the cycle continued. I feel that this reminiscence itself illustrates the need for regulation. However, I will proceed as I wish you to understand the full extent of my frustration with the topic of conversation today. After completing the first draft of my article, I sent it on to the editor at the time. When this draft was returned to me, it was accompanied by a list of helplines ranging from Dublin, Rice, Dublin Crisis Centre to text 50808, along with contact information from Garda Siakana, and finally, an offer from the editor herself to file a report on my behalf. I was genuinely taken by surprise. I had become so accustomed to this behaviour that while understanding it was despicable, I had been unaware that action could be taken against those who had wronged myself or anyone who has experienced similar issues. I was not privy to this information. I found that no one I knew was either. They were as taken aback by the notion as I was. 
I ask you all now to take a moment to transpose these situations from online into real life. Imagine the equivalent of these behaviours face to face. If your child was being harassed, called vulgar names by a stranger on their way to school, or were exposed to pornographic imagery by strangers in a public place, there would be uproar, there would be legal proceedings and constant discourse about how we must keep our children safe. Well, that is what's happening on a daily basis. However, in the virtual world, these perpetrators can hide behind the anonymity provided by the World Wide Web lurking in shadows and in Ill infiltrating innocent games played between friends over headsets. We must react the way we would if a scene such as this were to happen in broad daylight. We must use our voices on behalf of those unable to speak up or who are too young to comprehend the dangers of their virtual world. We are in dire need of this regulation. There must be a significant increase in awareness of online safety. This message is of utmost importance and should be a com common conversation had from an early age. The onus is on policymakers and media owners to protect our generation and forthcoming generations from online torment. It is globally estimated that the average age at which a child receives their first smartphone is 10 years old. Furthermore, 50% of children are availing of social media from as young as 12. When I was 12, I still believed in Santa. I still believe that my teddy sprung to life whenever I closed the door behind me. Are we truly willing to allow innocence to be shattered? We must do more and we must do so immediately. The establishment of an online safety commissioner is paramount. This action could potentially create a safer online environment for current and future users so that they will not have to endure the autocratic circumstances so many of us deal with on a daily basis. As I mentioned, I'm a Leaving Cert student and frankly, I'm in the middle of my exam week. There was not a single moment of hesitation when I decided I would like to speak today. This is not because I do not value my education or because I wanted a nice day off. I'm here because I have first-hand knowledge of the harm a lack of information regarding online safety can cause. I understand that discussing this topic is imperative. There was not a single moment of hesitation in my decision to address this topic. We ask you to pay us the same respect. Do not hesitate, as it may be us who have experienced this, but we will only be the first. We implore you to please act swiftly to prevent more of this behavior. We must be proactive in our decision-making so that we prioritize protecting our young people from online torment. As our keynote speaker, Leander said, children's rights apply to wherever children practice. Young people are entitled to complete protection. It has been a genuine privilege to address you today. Thank you for your patience and your time. Uh, Thank you very much for that, Ashling, that heartfelt uh, presentation. Uh, I, I think your point is well made that uh, the experiences of children online, if they were happening um, in, in real life, there would be uproar. And I think we have to get to the stage where the legislation takes account for that um, in, in protecting uh, children and young people. Thank you very much for that. Uh, and I hope you do well in your exams. Um, Thanks for that. Amy and Sophie, uh, young social uh, innovators, and they are going to talk about TikTok's ideal body makes starving a hobby. Amy and Sophie, you're welcome and thank you very much. Thank you very much for having us. Thanks. My name is Amy. And I'm Sophie. We did our YSI project on the dangers of TikTok for young, on young people. Our project is called TikTok's ideal body makes starving a hobby. We won our category of make our world healthier, physical health. TikTok grew immensely during the COVID-19 pandemic and which, sorry, the COVID-19 pandemic prevented us from going out and meeting friends. Like many other teens, we as a class all agreed that social media had become a huge part of our lives. We all found a common problem with TikTok. We'd all been negatively affected by certain trends, videos and comments on TikTok. As we carried out our research, we found that TikTok is projecting an unhealthy beauty standard with trends such as small waist challenge and promoting eating disorders with trends like eating disorder check and what I eat in a day. And prom this promotes dangerous diets for growing teens. We feel that if this isn't addressed and stopped urgently, problems with teenagers' mental health and eating disorders will rise. So that's why we created this project, to put an end to TikTok's ideal body. As our class got talking about TikTok, we all found a common problem with it. We are, we've all been negatively affected by certain comments, videos, and trends on TikTok. 
We found that there were a lot of videos on TikTok which featured hashtags which promoted unhealthy eating habits. For example, the hashtag what I eat in a day had 9.5 billion views and small waste had 305.8 million views. We will now show our YSI Speak Out video, which gives a glimpse into what many young people experience daily on TikTok. This year's staying at home has meant most teenagers are spending most of their time on social media, especially TikTok. As our class got talking about TikTok, we all find a common problem with it. We have all been negatively affected by certain comments, videos and trends on TikTok. When we conducted a survey to teenagers in our area, we found that 83% of teens thought TikTok promoted an unrealistic body image and 63% never or rarely found content with their body image. It, if this isn't addressed now, problems with teenagers' mental health and eating disorders will rise because we think TikTok's ideal body makes starving a hobby. Tested positive for being fat. Are you not balanced? Crop tops aren't your luck. Self-discipline might be a good idea. You are so gross. You're bigger than most girls on TikTok. Try running. Stop. The goal for our project is to make TikTok a safer and more enjoyable experience for all teenagers by promoting body positivity, restricting harmful content and putting trigger warnings on the content that can promote eating disorders or unhealthy eating habits. We have launched our project on all social media platforms and we regularly post support and advice for people who struggle with eating disorders. We have also launched a hashtag nobody has your body where we are trying to start a trend of putting positive post-it notes on your mirror to promote body positivity at home. We have also been invited to speak on Virgin Media News and LMFM to promote our project and raise awareness and end the stigma around eating disorders. We are a group of teens who are changing the idea of TikTok's ideal body. So as we said in the Speak Out video, we conducted a survey in our local area. It was found that 83% of teens felt TikTok promoted an unrealistic body image. We found 63% of people never or rarely felt happy with their body image. And we feel this is because social media and TikTok in particular have a dangerous effect on our body image. 71% said that they never, that they saw har harmful or negative comments in relation to body image on TikTok. Our goals for the project was to call on TikTok to address the issues. Our aim was to make TikTok a safer environment and we want TikTok to introduce restrictions on harmful comments as well as place trigger warnings on videos including content on eating disorders. So what we did to spread the word about the negative impact and dangers of TikTok, um, we went on LFM. We did this in the hopes of getting parents and adults attention to help them understand what was happening on these platforms and what was happening to the children. We've also contacted TikTok directly um, with the problem, but they're yet to respond, which really shows that they're not willing to look at these problems on their app. Um, to also help tackle this problem of young people struggling with body image, we regularly posted helpful information around body image, teenagers' mental health and eating disorders. We also started a hashtag on TikTok, as mentioned in our speak out video, in the hopes to prevent body, body positivity and young people to support each other. Um, we also, we also um, hosted first year classes in our school where we did some peer teaching on the dangers of TikTok, the toxic ideals it portrays, and gave them the ability to look after themselves online. We want to call on all social media platforms to protect the rights of children and their mental health on their platforms. 32% of TikTok users are between the age of 10 and 19. And we feel as though it should be a priority for TikTok to keep these users safe and to listen to young people's voices and opinions of their app. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Um, Amy and Sophie, thank you very much. Uh, a lot of very insightful contribution there. Um, and, and again, the, the theme is revisited that social media platforms are hugely positive, 
but they do need to be regulated to make sure the negative aspects are, are balanced uh, with those, those positive aspects. Um, I'm going to ask you uh, a couple of questions that will help us in, in, guide our in guiding our campaign to make sure that we do everything necessary to make sure we have uh, an act and that will um, definitely secure the safety of young people and children uh, while online and that the social media is, is correctly regulated. If I was to ask you, you were to give one message to the government who have responsibility for regulating the social media platforms and um, to, make, to, to ensure online safety for children, what was the one message you'd give uh, to government about keeping you safe online? Remember, guys, you're the experts here. You've given testimony which demonstrates just how knowledgeable you are and how much you understand the influences and effects of, of um, social media platforms. Um, you've told us how your, your online safety has been jeopardized, and you've given us some ideas as to how we can potentially um, manage that safety and, and make the environment more safe. But do, do any of you have any idea? What would be one message you give to government? Government being the all-powerful all body in Ireland that will, will, will legislate to make uh, online safety, uh, online platforms more safe. What would your one message be to government? Um, if I might answer that one, Tom. Oh, Johnson. yeah. Yeah. Um, I think the one message I would give to government is that it's part of their duty as the government to look after all their citizens, especially the young people in this country, in every aspect. So as it was uh, mentioned earlier, I'm just going to echo the statement that um, young people's safety doesn't end when we go online. It is part of their job to make sure we're safe online as well. It's part of their duty of care to the people they're meant to be in charge of. And I think that really this area is something they've been so lax in, something that they've just let fester, and they really need to act now to prevent any further bad things from happening from their lack of action over the past couple of years. So I would say my one message then would be that now is the time to act. You've left it long enough. This is part of your job. Thank you very much for that, Joe. What you're saying is we must act, or the government must act uh, on our behalf. Anyone else? What, what's your message to government? What is the message we can give to government on your behalf, or indeed that you can give directly to government um, to make sure that your safety and your peers' safety is maintained online? Amy and Sophie? Please. Well, as Joe said, it's the duty of the government to protect its young people, everyone in the country. So we think that the government should put more pressure on these social media sites and these apps put more pressure on them to take responsibility for what happens online, on their apps and on their sites, mm. because it has to be regulated in some way because it's such a big part of our lives. We need to do something to combat these issues that we find on a daily basis. Thanks for that. I think, again, you said it again, it is a big part of all our lives, particularly children and young people's lives. It's a very positive, um, a positive, um, facility that we have for, for keeping up with our with our peers and our friends and colleagues. And indeed, in you know, we're, we're two years into this global pandemic, um, social media platforms have been wonderful for keeping us together and keeping us contacted. However, um, I hear loud and clear uh, government need to act. You've demonstrated um, through your own testimonies uh, where uh, your safety can be jeopardized in very specific and very, very general uh, instances. So I think uh, your message seems to be, uh, as a government, you must act and act now. I am um, one other question. Uh, the government do, will do their job, but if you could speak directly to the people who who provide the platforms, in other words, the online platforms, and um, you have the experience of using these platforms, you have the experience of the positive aspects of these platforms, and indeed you've shared some of the negative experience that you've had uh, online. So if you were to give a message to the online platform providers, uh, what would it be in terms of, uh, what, what do they need to do to make you safe or to make you feel safe online? Lauren um, and I, Oh, sorry. <laughs> 
and then I'll go to you, Ashley. Don't worry, we've plenty of time. Um, we think that the social media platforms should definitely um, hire people to specifically make sure that the reporting process of like harmful posts is being monitored more carefully and that they can make the reporting process more detailed so people don't feel as unhappy and feel like they're being threatened online, if that makes sense. It does absolutely make sense. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for that, Lauren and Gonya and Ashley. Um, sorry, thank you. I was just going, just to reiterate a lot of what Leander said at the start, you don't become a child, like you don't become a grown up adult just because you have an account. If you're, if the age is 13, you're still 13, you were five years off becoming an adult. And I think that uh, corporations and media owners need to recognize that we don't just grow up as soon as we have a phone in our hand. And it's so detrimental to have that connotation around it. Like the copper law that, um, Leander mentioned it's just complete like marketing and it's all about profit but we're we're not money makers we're people and we there are real connotations around these things that happen and we just need to be so much more aware and put more pressure that it's not all about money there are human beings behind those screens and um, so I think that the main thing that they need to recognize is that the age of consent on online consent should be significant elder because so many people are suffering because of how young they're getting on social media and because of the fact there's no proper regulation around it that makes perfect sense thanks very much for that Ashley. um there's another question i want to ask and it's in relation to um what other things we can do to make sure uh, you're safe online and to make sure that that uh, your experience of uh, online media platforms is a positive one um should online safety be taught as part of the curriculum in school? Uh, you're all either school attenders or you're, you're uh, recent school leavers. So should online safety be part of the school curriculum? And if it should, what types of things should be contained in the curriculum, do you think? You're all nodding, nodding furiously, all right, that it should be part of the curriculum. But uh, what, what should... How should we teach? What should we teach and when? Uh, Neve first and then maybe a Amy and so Yeah, I would say that um, teaching in schools is extremely important because that's where young people are. And having an updated online safety curriculum is really important because we can teach them how to use their privacy settings, um, what areas can go wrong, um, how to block and report on all the apps that they want to use, just like I said in my presentation. And we should be also teaching them in a different way. As I said, we are taught to fear the internet. As young children, we are taught the internet is a bad place. Bad things will happen to you. But why do those bad th things happen to us? We need to know the procedures put in place, what the government is doing for us, and we need to know our rights on the internet. If we are being exploited, we need to know how we can act on that. And as Ashley said, she didn't know that she could act on what happened to her. So we should be taught that in schools. We can talk, you can go to these places. The government will help you. The social media apps will filter this out so you're not part of the attention economy. So I think teaching in schools is really important and that we should have an updated curriculum in our schools. Thank you, Neve. Thanks for that. Um, Amy and Sophie, did you want to get in there? Yeah, I just want to say, because last year, as I said, we did um, first year classes where we taught um, first years about online safety with TikTok and it was a great success because as they're 13 years old so they're kind of just starting their their whole journey of social media and most girls didn't know like what privacy settings they had to put on what things they had to do so it'd be great it was a great success so if we could do that in the future like we did last year it would be really good thanks for that uh, amy and sophie it does make make a lot of sense um our campaign is looking to have an online safety commissioner um, who would be responsible for uh, enforcing, or at least partly responsible for enforcing many of the, the elements of the, the, the upcoming act. Um, what difference do you think an online safety commissioner would have made to your experience, either positive or negative, of uh, social media platforms? Uh, and indeed, we're also seeking uh, an individual complaints mechanism. And would that have been of use to you uh, in your experience of, of using um, uh, online platforms? 
I know that's two separate questions there, but I mean, we're looking for a safety commissioner. So what, how would that how would how would that have helped you, or how would it help you in the future, Ashley? Um, well, as I spoke about in my piece, it was talking about how um, what had happened to me online and the things I experienced. So I think an online safety commissioner would definitely have been so helpful because I would have known that that information would have had those resources to make complaints straight away instead of just kind of um, taking it as a part of normal, normal life, which of course it, it isn't and wasn't and should not be um, acclimated to. So I think that it would just be so helpful because we would be a prevalent figure, allows information to be out there and it allows it to be very accessible to people who need it. Thanks for that, Ashley. And did somebody else want to get in there? Um, yeah. Sorry, Laura, Sorry about that again. Um, so we think um, when we were starting up our Instagram for our for our project, like we did, we had no idea how to filter comments and things like that. And it would have really helped us if we had been educated on it before. Like we had to go Google how to, if we could filter this or like how to. Well, we knew how to delete them, but if we could try filter it and. Um, we just think it would really help if there was something to teach people how to do this because it's not it's like you you can't really be expected to know how to do this just like yourself the technology is so complex it'd be great to have like a person to go to to be able to help out with that type of stuff that's great thanks very much um any other comments Listen, thanks very much for your participation uh, today. Uh, we've had um, the, the, the expert, uh, uh, Leander, but we've also had the experts by experience, uh, and you're the true experts in terms of uh, having experienced uh, uh, threats to your safety online. And indeed, as you've all said, there are also very positive aspects to, 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 to social media platforms that we need to... Um, um, that we need to acknowledge. So we have to find that balance between rigorous regulation uh, and to make sure that we can use the, these platforms positively. Um, your credit to yourselves, your credit to your families and your schools and your, 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 or the organizations that you represent. Well done. Um, you've been absolutely fantastic and you've given us food for thought uh, and given us a lot of direct experience that we can take away and we will use that to influence um, any decisions that we need to make in the future. Um, be proud of, of your participation today uh, and thank you very much. Um, for the rest of the meeting, um, you've heard the experts um, and I think it, it, it's, I, I have just so many thoughts and so many ideas uh, uh, based on, on uh, the input that they've given us today. Uh, and thank you very much. And on your behalf, I want to, to thank the youth panel. Uh, we'll move on now to get the political view. Um, we're pleased to be uh, to have the presence of Deputy Neve Smith, who is the uh, Fianna Fáil spokesman on arts, culture and heritage. And she's the chair of the Joint Directors Committee on Tourism, uh, Culture, Arts, and Sports and Media. The Media Committee oversees the Online Safety and Media Regulation Bill and recently published their report and recommendations following a lengthy pre-legislative scrutiny process. Deputy Smith will speak to some of the most important committee recommendations aimed at keeping our children and young people safe online. Uh, we will have time, some time, uh, for some uh, questions and answers after Deputy Smith's um, presentation. Um, so please feel free to use the, the Q&A um, facility uh, on Zoom. Um, thank you very much for taking time, Deputy Smith, um, and you're welcome. Thank you very much, Tom. Can you hear me okay? We can indeed, yeah. Perfect. And um, before I begin, I suppose, my formal presentation, can I just say a massive thank you to you, your youth panel? Um, I'm overwhelmed really by their articulate 
presentations here today, the variety, I suppose, of experiences uh, and also the very comprehensive suggestions that have been made in how we address uh, online safety, um, a safe cyberspace and I suppose based on very particular experiences uh, across the board. And I don't know if the young people will actually be here until the end of my own presentation, but I really hope that they are so I can maybe respond to them all individually because I've uh, taken copious notes on their suggestions, their experiences and I'd like to respond to that too. And also to thank Leanda also for her very technical presentation here this morning. And to you, Tom, of course, for organising it. So uh, can I just say one thing? I have a message here to say that uh, the youth panel are trending uh, number one. Um, I'm not entirely sure what platform, <laughs> but, but you're up there, guys. Well, that go. must be Twitter. That must be Twitter. And that's the positive side of social media, isn't it? And I mean, I think that's been, I suppose, the irony of the conversation that we have to have, uh, that juxtaposition of the positive uh, alongside the negative and we have to be mindful of both. And for us as policymakers, I suppose it's a balancing act to make sure we get that right. Uh, but at the moment, my description of, uh, of online is sort of the Wild West. There are no rules. And that is really problematic, particularly for young people. Uh, and I know, and I take very seriously my responsibility as a parliamentarian to address that. And it is wonderful. I feel very privileged to be in this position uh, of the as chair of the committee who had, had the very, I suppose, tedious task of scrutinizing this particular uh, policy bill. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Neve Smith. I'm a TD here in Cavan Monaghan, but for the purpose of this particular presentation today, it's important to say I'm the chair of the Joint Oireachtas Committee on Tourism, Culture, Arts, Sport and Media in the House of the Oireachtas. I'm delighted to be here with you today and I'd like to thank the Children's Rights Alliance for organising this hugely important event and for the opportunity to speak to you today. We've heard, heard many valuable contributions on, from key international speakers, um, national advocacy groups and youth speakers, all of whom have one clear goal in sight, a safe and engaging digital world that caters for children and young people by design and default. The protection of children across online services and platforms was a key element of the Joint Committee's um, work in examining the Online Safety Media and Regulation Bill. And I welcome the opportunity today to outline some of the key recommendations of the, the Committee's pre-legislative scrutiny of the general scheme of the bill, a bill which, in, when enacted, will, we hope, lead the way in Europe for the regulation of harmful content. And I was struck by what Leanne's comments were earlier, that you know, if one country leads the way it's generally um, such an imposition, if you like, on the digital world to do it for one country. The easiest thing to do is, is to do it broadly and globally. And hopefully that will be something that Ireland can be responsible for triggering. By way of introduction, the Online Safety and Media Regulation Bill 2020 is part of the programme for government and the committee undertook its scrutiny of the bill as a body of work of great importance and priority. The committee is convinced that the regulation is long overdue to protect young and vulnerable people from the onslaught and exposure of harmful content on social media platforms. The devastating effects are hurtful, cruel, painful and can lead to loss of life as, as some of our, our youth panel have spoken about this morning. The key proposals of the general scheme cover the following themes. The establishment of a new regulator, a multi-person media commission which will repeat place the BAI and also have commissioners with responsibility for online demand, audiovisual, media and online safety. The second thing is the role and powers of the online safety commissioner, and I know Tom you spoke about that, including the introduction of codes of conduct for online safety providers, including social media platforms, thereby creating a regulatory framework for online safety to tackle the spread and amplification of certain defined uh, categories of online harmful content. And finally, the transposition of the audiovisual media safety directive. At the forefront of the committee's approach to its pre-legislative scrutiny process was the Irish citizen. Our 33 recommendations champion effect, uh, sorry, effective and robust measures to deliver an optimal regulatory fr framework for the online environment and overarching media scape insofar as these fall into the scope of the bill. We call for individual complaint mechanisms, and I hope we get a chance to discuss that further, to be established to des to, for designated online platforms, for an online safety commissioner to be explicitly included in the legislation, 
for designated online platforms to be required to provide data for public interest research and for children's navig navigation of online safety to be protected so as not to render them vulnerable to data profiling. As the online environment has gradually become interwoven in the lines of all of sections of Irish society and the population, the committee has sought to understand how this legislation can best respect human rights while preserving the safety of every user. This work is crucial to a democratic and pluralistic society. The committee explicitly seeks to safeguard and promote participation in the processes of the future commission, media commission, that so that the regulatory landscape may develop in a responsive and effective manner. Furthermore, the committee cannot neglect the impact of this legislation on broadcasters and on online safety providers. Here, we put forward an array of recommendations to encourage the principles of clarity and proportionality to be upheld in the legislation. Further issues identified in, reg in relation to the online safety and related recommendations made in the report include the following. That the committee recommends the provision to be made for an individual complaint mechanisms within the general scheme of the bill. That the committee recommends where provisions are made for an individual complaint mechanism, these provisions be responsive to the needs and protection of children and young vulnerable groups, and that these include effective takedown procedures and other appropriate measures. And I hope we can get a chance to go into that in a little bit more detail. In its current form, these are current, there is currently no provision for an individual complaint mechanisms in the general scheme of the bill. Complaints may be made to the regulator or to certain non-governmental organisations that may, under the bill, be designated as super complaint services. However, the responses to such complaints can only be on a systematic and not on an individual basis. There, are, there was notable opposition to the establishment of an individual complaint mechanisms from some of the social media companies with whom the committee engaged, who suggested the operational scale of the complement of the Data Protection uh, Commission as the responsibilities and the remit of the regulator is extended in the general scheme. As with the Media Commission in general, the primary concern for a large number of stakeholders was that the Online Safety Commissioner should have the necessary expertise, staffing and resources available in order to carry out their functions satisfactorily. It was also noted that a further concern was the lacking of consistency in online education in schools and youth settings throughout the country. And to seek to address this, the committee recommends that a regulatory role in online safety education is explicitly included within the legislation for the online safety commissioner. We have recommended a ban on advertising to children online, including at the very minimum advertisements for junk food, alcohol, HFSS foods and gambling, and also that the committee recommends the uh, prohibition of any form of profiling or tracking of children's data. The committee heard evidence relating to children's rights to protection from material that is potentially harmful to their well-being, and such material could include advertising and commercial exploitation of children. Particular emphasis was placed on advertising, on addressing the advertising of gambling services, junk food and alcohol advertising to children in this regard. Another aspect of the online safety for children and young people is in relation to their privacy rights and how they can be best protected, which I know we have um, addressed, some of the young people have addressed earlier. The fact that children have a right to protection from material is the, that is potentially harmful to their well-being can be not, cannot be under, uh, un, un, understated, and such material could include advertising and commercially exploitation of children. It was suggested that there may be scope to develop codes around advertising standards and the protection of children within the present, uh, the present legislation. I'm almost at the conclusion and then we can get into the, the, meat, the meat and bones of it. Professor Connor O'Mahony, Special Rapporteur for Children uh, Protection, also pointed to the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child, who released a general comment in March 2021 pertaining to the rights of the child in relation to the digital environment. It states, states, parties should prohibit by law the profiling or targeting of children of any age for commercial purposes on the basis of a digital record of their actual or inferred characteristics, including group or collective data targeting by association or affinity. 
I suppose that concludes my introduction to the key recommendations uh, arising from the committee's pre-legislative scrutiny on the online safety and media regulation bill. Uh, those are the particular relevance of today's discussion. The committee look forward to the minister introducing the bill to the houses because this is actually the pre-legislative scrutiny bit. Now we've handed those uh, 33 recommendations back to the minister and she will now bring that forward to the houses for further discussion. Uh, and I hope that that uh, may allay some of the fears of the young people that um, have presented here today and I'm happy to take questions from those who are still on our, our, our discussion. Uh, we're, we're all still here, there's still quite uh, uh, extensive attendance. Uh, thanks for that uh, Deputy Smith. Just one question, is there any time, time frame on the publication of the bill or is that, is that? We expect it to come to the House very soon, Tom. I know that the, the Minister was very anxious to do that. We were very anxious that the uh, pre-legislative scrutiny be, would be completed comprehensively. We mm. spent a number of months doing that and we wanted to hear from as many, I suppose, groups as possible to ensure that that was done correctly. And I know that the Minister will want to do this as quickly as possible. Yeah, the organisers of, of this conference were sweating, making sure that if the bill was published before the, the conference started, there'd be a whole different conversation. But uh, we welcome the publication of the bill as soon as possible. So that's useful. Um, I, I don't and didn't uh, envy your task or the task of your committee in terms of the wide range and breadth of, of uh, elements that had to be considered uh, in such a bill. Uh, and... Uh, we, we look forward to hopefully all those recommend, recommendations uh, being included uh, in the bill. I'm just going to go straight to questions now, if you don't mind. Uh, this is Captain Riley. Will the committee be pushing for the recommendation they made be adopted in the bill during the committee stage, if not brought into the bill as published? I'll read that again because they didn't do it justice. Will the committee be pushing for the recommendations they made be adopted in the bill during the committee stage if they're not brought into the bill as published. In other words, uh, does the fight continue if those recommendations that you've made don't appear in the published bill? Absolutely. The one thing I'd say about the committee, and it was a cross-party committee, Tom, is that everybody is uh, very passionate about this. Um, I suppose we're there as legislators, we're there as public representatives. A lot of us are there as parents mm. uh, and, and, and perhaps siblings of brothers or sisters who have probably fallen victim to a lot of the online harmful content that you're talking about, the bullying. And I would have to say that every single member on that committee is hugely passionate about this, that the 33 recommendations put forward are uh, interwoven as part of the bill. And I I expect that the, you know every effort will be made to do that both in the house of the doll uh, in committee and perhaps the shannon as well yeah it's um it's a, it's a, a diff, difficult question but do you do you consider that those recommendations will be in the bill or is that something that that you'll just have to wait and see I, I'm afraid it's a wait and see, but I, I can assure you, as I said, of the 33 recommendations that were, you know, scrutinised over by each of the members, I suppose everybody has particular um, uh, recommendations that they feel very passionately about. And I know there will be every effort made from the committee's perspective to have as many of those uh, introduced a, a, as possible. Could I have a chance, Tom, maybe at this stage, just to respond to some of the young people, maybe that were you, on the you panel? You can indeed, you can indeed. Uh, if you want to... Um... Uh, come back on screen, um, the youth panel, and we can we can maybe have a discussion with with Deputy Smith. Thank you. I mean, um, just to say to you all, you were really so wonderful, and you know, I was overwhelmed by the articulate comprehension in terms of or comprehensive rather um, ideas and suggestions you put forward. And I took a note, and I've since joined uh, Lauren and Gronia's Red Flags uh, Instagram page. <laughs> Very good, girls. Well done. Gold winners. But I might just go through each of the of the panelists, if that's OK. Anya, when you spoke this morning, you spoke about um, first you, you alluded to um, the positive aspect that social media has been. And I suppose that's something that the committee has been mindful all the time of is that, you know, particularly during COVID, we all became our, our awareness of it became heightened because it was our way for communication. And I suppose as politicians and policymakers, we're always very um find it a very useful mechanism for getting our message out and for engaging with people and equally so as you talked about you know we had we had no school for months and we were very much dependent on online platforms and and such for um 
that communication. But going back to Anya, you talked about the cyberbullying, the fake accounts, the impact on mental health. And while, you know, people count up how many likes they got or how many friends they've got, or you talked about maybe seeing events people were at and then, you know, perhaps you weren't included in that. The loneliness by the same token, that the very place that you feel is a busy place that's full of, you know, very nice people. It can actually create a sense of um, loneliness um, and be very damaging towards your mental health. And you also gave some very good ideas on the education programs. And that came through, I think, a common thread with a lot of the panelists today. Uh, verification, verifying identity, uh, very important as well. So um, the, the, the education piece, I have to tell you, came up quite a bit also with the committee as well. A lot of our committee members suggested that there should be um, an onus on the on the tech giants to perhaps you know pool some revenue together that there might be a, be an opportunity that we can roll out an education program within schools. Now, up to this point, I suppose it's important to say that the only regulation that the online platforms have had is self-regulation. And any of you who have made a complaint, as I have myself and many of us had had before, the only um the only I suppose mechanism for that is their community standards and my experience of their community standards are that their standards their benchmark must be extremely 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 high for them actually to proceed with any takedown and we heard you know harrowing stories from parents that you know intervened with with social media giants in relation to harmful content for their own child and the length the extraordinary length they had to go to but more worryingly the time they had to wait for any takedown just isn't satisfactory and i hope that this bill will address all of those kind of concerns lauren and Grania, as i said you talked about your your um YIS, YSI uh, project and your red flags. I've joined it. I intend to keep a very close eye on it because I think what you've done there, particularly with your visual aids, you know, I'm I'm a big believer. I come from an arts background and I always think, you know, a picture can speak a thousand words and it can be very impactful on a community, whether it be a school community, a town community, society at, at, at large. And I think you have really, you know, found something there that could be rolled out nationally and extremely useful and helpful. And I want to thank you and encourage your continued work at that. Joe, you talked particularly about discrimination and hate speech and um, the idea that it gives a voice and amplifies, I suppose, hate speech towards colored people, towards women, towards minority groups, and um, how people can become absorbed and almost consumed by it. And I think, you know, by this uh, uh, um, online media commissioner, they are the kind of things that we can uh, address and they are the kind of things that we can um, make sure that it's monitored and monitored and what, what I didn't get to talk about maybe enough was about we did actually have the online safety commissioner from Australia in and they talked about the resources that are behind it and while we have felt a little bit of pushback we'll say from the department in relation to the importance of an individual complaint mechanisms I am firm in my own mind and my own beliefs and having the experience of the Australian e-commissioner in before us, it is quite possible, it is quite doable. And without that, this legislation won't have the teeth and the mechanisms that it needs to be really, really effective. And I just wanted to say that to you that hope, hopefully that will address some of the issues you talked about. Alec, you talked about a very um, positive experience and that's really important too, because we have to say that um, it has allowed people to engage with others, it has, you know, as you say, you found very safe cyber spaces in LGBT um, groups to, I, I suppose, um, find um, other people that were going through the same experience as you. And I have to say, I suppose you're 18, you're very articulate, you're very bright, you're very smart, and that comes across in your presentation today. And equally so, uh, I suppose the 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 purpose of the legislation will be to maybe ensure that you know the younger groups in society, the 12, the 13 year olds, and we all know that children much younger than 13 are now on, 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 on phones and on technology and, you know, can be unfortunately exposed to that. So I suppose the job for us is to make sure that more young people have the positive experience of safe cyberspaces that you've articulated here today. Neve, you give us me some great ideas in, ter in terms of digital skills. And again, you talked about uh, education and teaching, I suppose, about controls and blocking reports and um, 
the lack of uh, procedures. So I really hope that that is something that this legislation will address and that that online safety um, commissioner will have the teeth and the mechanisms to uh, insist on education, insist that controls are in place and that young people are made aware of those controls. Um, because uh, unfortunately and very sadly, we all know that the absolute extreme of that is where young people have taken their own lives and we can cite examples where social media has had an impact. We can cite how pylons on people, young and old, has had a massive negative impact um, and that feeling of rejection that you talked about so eloquently, Neve. Um, and I just wanna thank you for, for, your, for your input and your suggestions today. And I just want to let you know that the secretariat from my committee are online and taking copious notes too of all the suggestions being made today. Ashley, you spoke extremely, extremely passionately about your experience and, and a very negative one, it has to be, to be said. And you're right, that's because there has been no procedures in place. And you're right, it is policymakers' job to ensure that that online torment is stopped. Uh, and, and that we act swiftly in your own words to ensure that that negativity um, is, is pulled out of social media and online spaces and that this, uh, the cyberspace is a safe space. As Leander quite rightly put it, you know, to say that this is parents' job to put blocks and controls, parents don't know what how to work it themselves. So there is a complete disadvantage. Uh, uh, and, you know, it is down to us policymakers, and hopefully this online safety commissioner will have the full resources of the state to ensure, because in my mind, this is something that's as important as climate action, which I know young people feel equally, equally passionate about. Finally, just to say about Amy and Sophie, you actually focused on an area that I would say uh, you focus particularly on TikTok uh, and why we had TikTok and Facebook and Twitter uh, and a lot of those online safety giants in before the committee. TikTok, and I suppose it's a generational thing, none of the, the committee uh, members would be as au fait or familiar with TikTok as what you've so eloquently put forward today. And to me, it is just frightening to hear about hashtags, about small waste, hashtag what I eat in a day. I mean, that is just so irresponsible. And it is the job I suppose uh, it is the job of legislators to ensure that that is not allowed to continue and, and I mean you get very staggering and frightening figures in terms of the number of users using those hashtags and the spread that had that has not just nationally globally and I'm, I'm very aware um, in, in terms of what you cited here today with your y YSI project uh, and I want to thank you for that and I hope I haven't left out anybody in my response to the, the youth panel today but just to say if if there's something you feel very passionate about that you, you think of afterwards or that I haven't touched on today please do feel free to get in touch with me via email or online dare I say it <laughs> um, I'd be very happy to take those um, ideas and suggestions on board. Thank you very much for that, Deputy Smith. Does anyone want to respond to that? Or are we happy that, that we will go away and maybe in the future we'll get back to, to, to Neve with, with uh, comments and suggestions? Um, just to reiterate one thing, um, I am the chair of the Children's Rights Alliance, but my day job, I'm a, I'm a director of services here at St. Patrick's Mental Health Services, and I can absolutely confirm um, what has been said today that, that um, there are hugely negative mental health impacts of social media and I can I can uh, attest to those on a daily basis here with the young people we provide care and treatment for uh, and one of the difficulties or one of the impacts the negative impacts on a person's mental health are the, the, the things you've spoken about in terms of uh, the, the negative impacts of, of um, social media platforms including pro-anorexia sites and pro-suicide sites and um, it, it absolutely needs needs um, robust regulation. Um, thank you for joining us, uh, Deputy Smith. I don't think we have any more questions from the, uh, the uh, participants. Um, and uh, thank you very much. And we will no doubt we look forward to the, the, the publication of the bill. And hopefully when the bill is published, it will contain uh, absolutely every one of the recommendations that the committee has put forward and hopefully our work will be done if not we will obviously continue as you will in, in your campaign to make sure that that uh, our children and young people are safe online so thank you very much for your contribution today thank you very much thomas it's been a real pleasure
Thank you. Um, I'd like uh, to close the conference. I'd like to call on uh, Tanya Ward. Tanya Ward is the CEO of the Children's Rights Alliance, and she has provide, provided excellent stewardship uh, and leadership uh, for the Alliance and its, and its members uh, over the past 10 years. And I've been a first-hand witness to that excellent stewardship over that time. Um, Tanya is going to speak, uh, make some closing remarks uh, in relation to the, our topic today. Tanya. Thanks, Tom, and thanks so, so, so for so ably chairing today's event. It was really great to sit back and, and listen to some brilliant expert inputs um, from the ANDA in, in Five Rights Foundation from all our youth advocates who are really, you know, top game when it comes to naming the experiences that children and young people are having, but also coming up with the solutions. And I want to pay a special tribute to Deputy Neve Smith and her colleagues on the Oireachtas Committee for the really thorough work that they have done in relation to online safety. Um, the 33 recommendations that they've made are really critical. And if they were implemented in Ireland, but not only in Ireland, but in every other country, I think the online experience for children and young people would change uh, very seriously. So thank you for doing such a thorough uh, piece of work. I suppose in, in, in just with a few concluding remarks, really all I wanted to say was to thank our, our Children's Rights Alliance members, the 16 organisations for doing um, an extraordinary amount of work around the, uh, the legislation on, on online safety matters. I, I think what's really critical, and you can see from today, the importance of children's rights guiding everything we do when it comes to the digital world for children and young people, and making sure that children and young people themselves are getting to shape um, the agenda uh, when it comes to online safety. You can see they're, they're able to articulate what the issues are. They're also able to articulate what the solutions are. And I think we collectively have to make sure we create those opportunities for them to influence and shape what happens um, legislatively. The other thing I think that's really cr critical from today's event as well was really thinking about um, change in this area, about product design about safe product, apologies, I have a kitten here and it's, it has decided to jump on the, on the desk beside me, um, is uh, product design. I think that's really important uh, paradigm for us to adopt. And the other piece is regulation and what regulation looks like. And for those of you to think about the future, there will be an online safety commissioner that is established uh, in law. And to really, I think we need to commend the government for doing that as a piece of work, because by doing that, they're, they are taking on the tech giants who have all their headquarters here, who are responsible for generating huge uh, amounts to, G to GDP, but also providing really important employment as well. So I think that is very significant that the government is moving ahead with the establishment of this online safety commissioner. But for us in the important is the education piece, is regulating what happens around education and making sure that children and young people have the right toolkit to um, protect them in the online world. But the other piece is that individual complaints mechanism. Children and young people actually need solutions and remedies. And this will be really important for the government to try and find a solution in relation to this. It's going to be difficult, but it is important the government is, trying, is able to craft some sort of solution. But the other piece that's critically important is the new online safety commissioner will be pre preparing a code which uh, online safety companies will have to comply with. And that's really important because that code could be the place where all the special rules that have been talked about here by Leanda, by Deputy Smith, by the children and young people on this, on this session, that, that code is going to be really important. And I'd say to Children's Rights Alliance members and children and youth advocates, this is where we need to move our focus in, in our next stage as well. And my last point would be, I think we need to be ambitious because you heard from Leanda, everything we do in, her, in Ireland will have an extraordinary impact in, in relation to regulation throughout the world. It's rare in Ireland that we get to be the ones influencing and setting the agenda internationally. But that's the case in this area. And I think there's a huge responsibility on all of us working within the Irish context to really step up to the plate, to really set the standard for what happens, uh, because it won't just help children and young people in Ireland, it'll help children and young people throughout the world. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, that was a, an excellent summation of um, all the, the, the topics we covered today. And indeed, um, we need to be ambitious. I think I would would endorse that 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 
wish um, we should be ambitious um, for the safety of our children uh, and the rights of our children um, as they relate to, to the online environment. Um, it just falls to me now to close the conference. Uh, at a personal level, uh, I've done this quite a number of times over the past two years, and I hope, I fear, and I say this after every conference, I hope that we will meet physically, we will meet uh, you know, together collectively at some stage in the future. I know we can't at the moment, and nor should we, um, but uh, we should keep hope and be sure that we will. Uh, we are social beings, we are social animals. Uh, we do need to meet collectively, and I've no doubt in the future we will. And I fervently hope this will be the last screen uh, conference that we do and that we get to a stage where we're, uh, we've beaten the, the COVID-19 virus and we get to, to, to meet collectively. And I look forward to meeting you collectively in the future. Um, can I thank Denise Charlton and the Community Foundation for Ireland for the continued support um, for the campaign. And the campaign, we will assure them the campaign is ongoing and will continue. Can I also extend a sincere thanks uh, to Leander Barrington Leach for taking time out in obviously what is a, an incredibly busy schedule um, in the work that she's doing in the UK for the Five Rights um, organization. And just again, to note the, 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 the impressive uh, breadth and width of, uh, of her expertise in relation to online safety for children and thank her for, for, for sharing that expertise. Um, when I was listening to our uh, uh, young panel, youth panel um, contributors, I was trying to think back to when I was their age, which was quite some considerable time ago. And I can tell you guys, there was no way I was anywhere near as articulate and intelligent um, uh, and as clear in my thoughts and opinions as you are today. And I think, as I said, you've done yourself proud uh, and you've helped us in, in how, we, how we can make our decisions and, and push to make sure that, that uh, your safety um, and your peers' safety online will be assured. Uh, to all the members of the, the Alliance involved in the 123 Online Safety Campaign, uh, you've worked very hard on this up until now, and I've no doubt your work will continue with the publication of the bill and then, then uh, and, and how it makes its way through the Oireachtas um, into spring uh, next year. And uh, thank you for your, your ongoing support and your ongoing uh, commitment. Um, to Deputy Smith, uh, thank you again for, you, you're, you're obviously way on top of your brief. You're very clear and, and you have clear understanding of what needs to be done. Uh, thank you for the recommendations and the recommendations that your, your committee have, have made. And hopefully we'll see those coming through in the, in the, the soon to be published bill. Um, the conference ends now, um, but the work of the campaign will continue right through, as, as I say, as the bill progresses through the Oireachtas uh, up until next spring and further. So for those of you who are interested in the online safety issue in regulation, or if you want to hear more about uh, what the campaign and uh, what the campaign does and how it does its work, uh, I want you to contact Emma uh, or any member of the team um, and engage with the conversation as it continues with the hashtag 123 online safety. And finally, um, I do this on a fairly regular basis, um, but I never, get, I never tire of it. Can I thank uh, Tanya and the whole Children's Rights Alliance team for the work they've done on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis, particularly in these trying times, and particularly to Julie, Sersha, Stephen and uh, Emma, who has guided me for most of the morning in relation to uh, this conference. And indeed, she leads on, on the campaign over, overall. Thank you very much for your participation uh, in the, in the, the uh, conference today. And please bring all that you've learned today forward so that we will ultimately get where we want to be is to have our children safe online and to have a properly regulated uh, online environment. And to all, thank you very much. And we hope to see you uh, collectively and in person at some stage in the future. Uh, thank you very much.